Good morning, everyone. Uh, and uh, let me welcome you to the friendly confines of uh, Falk Auditorium here at the Brookings Institution. And I'd also like to welcome uh, virtually the more than 1,500 people who are watching this event live as it, as it is streamed. I think it's an indication of the interest that the topic has aroused. But I've gotten ahead of myself. Uh, my name is Bill Galston. I'm a senior fellow here at Brookings. And on behalf of the institution as a whole and the Governance Studies Program, a venerable, indeed founding part of Brookings, it's my pleasure to welcome all of you to this event, which is the latest, but I fervently hope not the last fruit of a more than decade long collaboration between the Public Religion Research Institute and the Brookings Institution. Uh, as many of you probably know, uh, this collaboration for more than a decade has produced the annual American Values Survey, uh, which has become a real cornerstone of our collaboration. But from time to time, we get an opportunity to do a deep dive into a, a timely topic of special interest. And today's report and meeting uh, represent a perfect illustration of the deep dive and what it can produce. Uh, we'll be talking today about Christian nationalism, uh, which is really at the heart of much of contemporary American politics uh, and which cries out for a better understanding, uh, not only among scholars, but also journalists and citizens than it has received so far. We hope that you will emerge from today uh, enlightened uh, and invigorated, but not angered. Uh, it's now not only my duty, but also my pleasure uh, to introduce uh, the CEO of the Public Religion Research Institute, Melissa Deckman. Uh, if I had the rest of the the rest of the session, I could walk you through her many accomplishments. Uh, suffice it to say that she's a political scientist who studies the impact of not only religion but also gender and age on public opinion and behavior. Uh, among her other writings, she's the author of Tea Party Women, which examines the role of women in conservative politics. Uh, and her writings, in addition to scholarly locations, have appeared in obscure publications such as the New York Times, the Washington Post, CNN, The Hill, Vice News, The Wall Street Journal, 538, and Politico, which pretty much covers all the bases. Uh, and so now let me, without further ado, turn the podium over to her. Uh, on behalf of PRRI uh, to fill you in further on the event. Melissa? Thank you, Bill. That was a very gracious introduction. Good morning, everybody. Since 2009, Public Religion Research Institute has served as a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization dedicated to conducting independent research at the intersection of religion, culture, and politics. And the Brookings Institution, um, as Bill indicated, has really been a steadfast partner with us over the years. And I believe this is our 17th joint public event uh, with EJ and, and Bill and the Brookings Governance uh, Studies team. So on behalf of PRI, I'd like to welcome you to our presentation today on the findings from this very important new study on Christian nationalism. This survey of more than 6,000 Americans conducted jointly with Brookings sheds new light on the underpinnings of Christian nationalist ideology. As always, it's a pleasure working with both E.J. Dion and Bill Gostin and the Brookings team. Um, thanks also to the staff of Brookings for helping to organize this event this morning. 
I'd also like to acknowledge the excellent work done by our talented team at PRI, including Dr. Natalie Jackson, who is our Director of Research at PRI, and our research staff, including Dr. Deanna Ortiz, Ian Huff, and Maddie Snodgrass. Um, we couldn't be here today without the work of our Chief of Staff, uh, Sean Sands, who helps coordinate all of these events and does so many things behind the scenes as well as our digital communication specialist, Jessica Royce, and our operations associate, Tony Baptiste. And we're also very grateful for our graphic designer, Tim Duffy, for making the report look so beautiful. Um, I also wanted to say thank you to our panelists for appearing today, and also just to note that Dr. Anthea Butler was originally scheduled to appear on our panel. She's a professor at, at the University of Pennsylvania, but unfortunately had a family emergency. So just wanted to make that note. And finally, I wanted to recognize one special guest in the audience, Todd Stiefel. He is the founder of the Stiefel Free Thought Foundation, uh, who is one of our general uh, funders. We're very grateful for the support of the Stiefel Foundation for the work of PRI. And for those of you watching along today on live stream, all 1,500 plus of you, uh, which is exciting, you can find a full copy of the survey at our website at www.prr. I.org. Um, you can also sign up for regular takes um, about news at the intersection of religion and politics, including our morning buzz. And as you'll see in the corner there, um, hashtag Christian nationalism if you want to follow along with some live tweeting uh, and, and looking at some commentary about the event today as well. It is my pleasure now to introduce to you Dr. Robert P. Jones, the president and founder of PRI. He is the author of White Too Long, The Legacy of White Supremacy in American Christianity, which won a 2021 American Book Award. He is also the author of The End of White Christian America, which won the 2019 Graumauer Award in Religion. He holds a PhD in Religion from Emory University, an MDiv from Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary, and a BS in Computing Science and Mathematics at Mississippi College. Without further ado, Robbie. Hi, everyone. Glad to see everyone here in person. And again, uh, so grateful of so many um, online. Well, it's my job to take you through the main findings of the survey uh, today. Uh, and I'm going to do that uh, via this PowerPoint presentation. It's going to be um, a fairly quick uh, drive through the data. We'll have time to unpack it uh, a little bit later. But I'm, I'm thrilled to be here, see all of you in person. Uh, so thank you for being here. Um, without further ado, let me just jump in. Here, um, first, just some uh, basics to see what you're so you know what you're looking at. Uh, the survey was conducted at the very end of last year, between November 21st and December 14th. Uh, responses uh, representative sample of over 6,000 Americans. It's a very large survey, gives us a, a fairly small margin of sampling error and ability to break out smaller subgroups uh, with higher confidence. Um, uh, it was made possible uh, through the general support of the Foundation to Promote Open Society, with additional support from the Carnegie Corporation of New York the Wilbur and Hilda Glenn Family Foundation, and the Unitarian Universalist uh, program at Shelter Rock. So thank you uh, to all of those funders who made this study uh, possible today. All right. So uh, one of the biggest questions in front of us uh, was how to measure this idea of Christian nationalism. Uh, and one of the ways that we uh, do that, as we've done with other uh, studies in partnership with Brookings, uh, is to kind of think about this as a com kind of composite worldview and to get not just one question, but a number of questions to help us zero in um, on, on a particular orientation toward a topic. So in this case, um, we use five questions here to construct a Christian nationalism scale. And basically the way this works is you ask everyone these questions, uh, you get sort of completely agree, somewhat agree, somewhat disagree, completely disagree, uh, and then you score people like one through four, right, for, for each of those answers. And then you standardize the scores, you add them all up, then standardize them between zero and one, and everybody gets a composite score for how they answered all five of these questions. They could be high on one, low on another, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so these are the percentage of the American public who agree with each of these questions, right? So ranging from a low of God has called Christians to exercise dominion over all areas of American society. One in five Americans, 20%, um, agree with that statement. Ranging down here from the high, 40% uh, uh, of Americans agree with the statement, either completely or someone agree with the statement, U.S. law should be based on Christian values. And you can see other questions in between. So we combine all of those questions. So everywhere where you see Christian nationalism, adherence, uh, or other categories, it is based on these five questions. 
So um, uh, how do those questions then sort Americans? Uh, we, we basically looked at the distribution of the data, and it looked like it's, it sorted Americans into four basic categories. These are names that we assigned uh, to these groups, right? So we didn't ask people about these names. We, com we came up with these labels to describe where people fell along that continuum with those five questions. So uh, starting at the top, uh, we gave the name of the people who completely or mostly agree with almost all of those statements, uh, Christian nationalism adherents. They basically had a composite score of 0.75 to 1 when we added all those questions together and standardized the scale. Um, one way to think about them is they're just people who overwhelmingly agree or completely agree with all five questions. Uh, the next group down are sympathizers. Uh, these are people who agree, but they are less likely to completely agree uh, with those statements. They had this composite score between 0.5 and 0.74. And then finally, kind of goes down the same way, skeptics, those who disagree, but less likely than the last category to completely disagree, and then rejectors. And this category is actually a little bit different because they completely disagreed with all five questions, right? So there were enough people in that category to just have, so they had a score of zero, right? Which meant that they, scored, they completely disagree with everything in the scale. So where do Americans fall? Um, if you take those categories, um, this is what the country looks like. Um, on the one hand, um, in the top category of adherents that com almost completely agree with everything in the scale, it's 10% of Americans. Uh, there are an additional 19% of Americans who we call um, Christian nationalism sympathizers. That is, those who lean toward supporting that, but, with, but less um, strongly than, than adherents do. So basically, it's 3 in 10 Americans right, who lean into supporting uh, this Christian nationalist view with only 10% uh, in the top category. So that leaves you know, the rest of the country um, kind of leaning the other way. 39%, uh, uh, nearly 4 in 10, uh, are skeptics, again, mostly disagree. Uh, and then we have 29% that completely disagreed uh, with, all, with all five of those, those questions. So one way of thinking about this, this wedge here is that there are basically as many people who completely disagree as there are who either completely agree or uh, somewhat disagree with those five statements. And then a plurality of Americans leaning away. Right, it's kind of one way of thinking about this. So three and ten on one side, and six and ten. It's basically a two to one uh, 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 ratio between those who lean away from uh, supporting that orientation and those who lean toward supporting Christian nationalism. So that's kind of where the country is as a whole. And I'm going to break it down for you a little bit so you can see how it goes across demographic groups. You'll get a little better idea um, here. Uh, oh, but first, let me get this one orientation question here to kind of give you a sense of uh, how. Uh, how it operates on a, on a basic question about what the nation should look like in terms of religious diversity and pluralism. So we had this question, we had two options uh, response could pick from. I would prefer the U.S. to be a nation made up of people belonging to a wide variety of religions, or I would prefer the nation to be primarily made up of people who follow the Christian faith. Now, as a country as a whole, like that same pattern, it's basically a three to one uh, lean uh, toward the first question. I would prefer the nation to be made up of people belonging to a wide variety of religions. Nearly three quarters of the country believes that, um, compared to only about a quarter who would like to see a primarily Christian nation. But check out what happens across these categories to give you a sense of the orientation here. So there are Christian nationalism adherents, basically mirror images uh, of the public, right? Um, so they're leaning completely the opposite way. Three quarters said they'd prefer the nation to be primarily made up of those who follow the Christian faith. Uh, among sympathizers, you'll see they lean, they're a little more divided, still lean toward uh, majority, uh, saying they prefer the nation to be made up of the Christian faith. And then here are the other two categories here. You can see big, big differences, right, in terms of what they want, what uh, these different groups want the country uh, to look like. So that's just kind of give you a sense of how strongly they think about religious pluralism in the country here. Uh, one other thing we did was um, the term Christian nationalism, as many of you know, is fairly new in our public um, kind of vocabulary, and so it's part of the vernacular, but uh, it's, it, we were wondering about how many people actually know about the term and whether they think about uh, the term, and this turned out actually some pretty interesting uh, uh, data. So f the first thing is to say that um, those who are Christian national adherents are much more likely to view the term favorably, right? So it doesn't have a pejorative ring uh, to those who actually are Christian nationalism adherents. Uh, sympathizers, a little less likely so, and then as you can see, down to skeptics and rejectors, uh, very few have a positive association with the term. But here's something fairly interesting, is that a plurality of Americans have not heard of the term, right? Uh, so we have a, a, a big swath of the country, and even among adherents, uh, four in 10 uh, say they don't really know 
um, uh, haven't really heard of the term and don't have an opinion about it. Uh, noticeably here, the people most likely to have heard of the term are the people who oppose it. Right? Um, so the rejectors are the ones who really, only 19% of the rejectors say they haven't heard of the term. Uh, but here's the other side of it. You can see here are people who say they have either a mostly unfavorable or a very unfavorable view of the term. Uh, and you can see the rejectors down here, 71% very unfavorable uh, view of the term. But among adherents, right, it's, it's very clear that those who know about the term overwhelmingly have a positive association uh, with it. Um, so who are uh, Christian nationalism adherents? I'm kind of walking through some demographics here. Uh, one of the uh, more interesting things here is how does this break along religious lines? I'm going to put up just the first half, the adherents and the sympathizers here. Um, and the first thing to say is that the top one here, white evangelical Protestants, really do stand alone. Uh, there's no other religious group um, in the country that's anywhere near. Uh, this is basically two-thirds of white evangelicals who are either in the, first, the adherent category or the sympathizer category. Um, this, this group, Other Protestants of Color, is, is an interesting one, too. It doesn't actually show up on most surveys because this is only 3% of the population, right? So the reason why we have it here is because we have a very large survey. We're actually able to break this group out. Um, it, can, it's a, it's, it is a kind of mixed group. It consists of uh, uh, Asian American and Pacific Islander Protestants. Mixed race Protestants are those who are of a, a racial or ethnic identity other than black or Latino, um, right? And so it's a, it is a mixed group. It does tend to lean Republican and lean conservative. Um, so that's one of the reasons why you see it uh, up there really in the neighborhood of Latino Protestants. Latino Protestants also, uh, you see the real difference between Latino Protestants and Latino Catholics uh, here on, on the chart. Um, that really goes toward their voting patterns. Latino Protestants tend to uh, lean toward voting for Trump. Uh, Latino oh, Catholics lean toward voter, um, voting for Democratic presidential candidates very consistently over the last few years. And then there is, we'll talk more about this, there is one Democratic-leaning constituency that's up there around 4 and 10, and that is black Protestants, right, who, who tend to score higher uh, than, than other uh, kind of Democratic-leaning constituencies. We'll come back to that in a minute, but just kind of flag that here. And then clearly those who are uh, non-Christian religious traditions, uh, uh, Jewish Americans, and the religiously unaffiliated, very, very few, right, in the Christian nationalism uh, cohort. And just here's the other side, um, just so you can see it. Uh, but among white evangelical Protestants, it really is only about a third uh, who are either skeptics or rejectors. That group stinks out more than any, any other group. Uh, one other question um, uh, that, that uh, often comes up is like whether people who claim to be Christian nationalists are really just nationalists, right? Um, uh, and whether they are, really are religious or whether they're just Christian in name only is the term that gets thrown out um, a lot of times. What we found is, in fact, that um, religious attendance is positively correlated with, uh, with, claim, with um, belief in Christian nationalism uh, views, right? So the more likely you are to attend church, the more likely you are uh, to hold Christian nationalist views. So it is very connected to uh, churches, not to people who are just sitting it out um, on, on Sunday morning. So those who attend once a week or more, uh, basically half of that group um, is either in the adherent or sympathizer category. As you go down to less frequent uh, religious attendance, you see the less likelihood of being either a Christian nationalism adherent or a sympathizer. Here's the other side, just so you can see that as well. So I think that's an important kind of contribution to the study as well. Um, here's one other thing, is that we found that that evangelical identity um, is actually operative not just in white circles, uh, right, but it is operative in African American uh, and Hispanic circles as well. Um, so uh, for example, um, here is uh, among whites who are, uh, among whites, those who identify as evangelical or born again um, are <clears throat> basically about five times as likely uh, to be an adherent than those who are Christian but not evangelical, right? So that's the difference that an evangelical identity makes among whites here. And you see a very similar thing among Hispanic Americans, those who identify as evangelical are born again, much more likely to be adherents than those who are Christian but do not identify as evangelical, and a similar thing among African Americans as well. Um, the factor, you know, is here somewhere between a factor of five and six uh, that evangelical identity makes even within uh, different racial or ethnic uh, groups and the likelihood of being um, an adherent. Uh, and here is partisanship um, as well. Um, uh, there is, uh, you know, we uh, sometimes in political science circles, you will hear the term asymmetric polarization, right? So we know that we're polarized, right? But the asymmetry of it, right, is important. And here we really see this, right? We've got a majority of Republicans, 54% in either uh, the Christian nationalism adherent or the sympathizer category. Uh, independents way down at 23, Democrats at 15. Um, 
So um, kind of just to kind of pause here for a moment, um, if we take the religious and the political thing together, what we see is the country, right, two to one leaning against uh, these ideas of Christian nationalism, but one religious group, two-thirds of white evangelicals leaning toward it, and one political party, Republicans, leaning uh, toward it. So that's kind of the, the kind of power picture uh, that we're seeing um, in terms of uh, what these numbers mean here. Uh, one of the things that is playing a, a big role in this and driving this is media, media consumption. So who people most trust. And the way we ask this question is, who do you most trust to give you accurate information about current events and politics? And we give a whole range of television news sources here. This first category, uh, far right news, are outlets like uh, One American News, Newsmax, uh, those kinds of new, they are newer media outlets on television. Uh, but uh, you can see the difference that these make here, right, and driving uh, adherence to Christian nationalism. Uh, those who trust those more far-right news outlets uh, overwhelmingly, so eight, eight and ten, uh, right, are in one of these top two categories. Uh, Fox News continues to play a big role there. They've got a bigger uh, uh, following than, than the other far-right news, but 54% looks about like the Republican number uh, here um, uh, are either in the adherence or sympathizers category. Uh, those who say they do not trust any television news sources are kind of lower, and those who trust basically any other uh, uh, mainstream news, sort of broadcast news, CNN, et cetera, are down here about, about a quarter in those categories. And then here's the other side. Um, and you really see the, you know, the, the difference between these top two uh, and really anything else uh, here. That, so it is this kind of these media centers driving uh, this worldview as well. Um, I'm going to show you some things about demographics here. Um, one interesting thing um, is there really aren't that many gender differences uh, here in likelihood of uh, being a Christian nationalism adherent or a Christian nationalism sympathizer. They look very, very similar. Uh, there are some age differences uh, that you'll see here, and the break is basically under 50, over 50. That's where we see the biggest, uh, the biggest breaks. They're not huge, but they are, they are kind of linear and with a big jump between over, over 50, the, those o uh, older, more likely to be Christian nationalism adherents or sympathizers. Uh, education, very similar thing, a break between college, four-year college degree, or more, uh, and those with some college or less. Uh, here you can see, you know, and it, if you look at the rejectors too, you can kind of see the, you know, the, those with a four-year college degree basically twice as likely as those with a high school uh, or less uh, degree to be uh, Christian nationalism rejectors. Uh, and here we saw less differences by race uh, than we really thought we might see. I'm going to come back to this in a minute. We saw a hint of that in the uh, black Protestant numbers and the religion slide. Uh, but basically the numbers between uh, all, all white Americans, all black Americans, look very, very similar, right? There, there's some small differences here, but, but not big ones uh, here. And I'm going to come back to the role that whiteness plays uh, in a moment. Um, so we also were interested in this survey in thinking about how does Christian nationalist views correlate with other kinds of ideologies that have been circulating, particularly on the political right. Um, so we're going to ask about um, a, a number of these and show you the correlations here uh, so that, you know, what basically is the Christian nationalist views don't sit in a vacuum. They're intersecting with a number of other uh, sets of views. So here are a number of views um, that have to do with kind of denials of structure, structural racism um, in the country. Um, and, uh, and in each of these, you'll see that we have all Americans as the top one and Christian nationalism adherence uh, in the second one. And, and we've scaled them all the same direction so you can kind of see it. Uh, so some are agree, some are disagree, depending on which direction the question leaned. So the first one, just to give you an example, um, generations of slavery and discrimination have created conditions that make it difficult for many black Americans to work their way out of the lower class. So the number, this is the number of people who disagree with that statement. In other words, deny that anything in the past has anything to do with upward mobility or opportunities uh, for, for African Americans today. Among all Americans, 45% uh, disagree with that statement, but among uh, Christian nationalism adherents, 70% disagree with that statement, right? So big jump here, so positive correlation. And you can see that across all the rest of these questions. I won't read them all, uh, but you basically see this you know, 20, 30 point jump uh, among Christian nationalism adherents. And here I do want to see, show you across the next few slides the difference that sort of white identity makes within Christian nationalism, right, uh, here. And you'll basically see these numbers just tick up one more click. Uh, among those who are Christian nationalism adherents and who are white. Uh, basically, at least another 10 points uh, that, they, that they come up the scale. So in that one we were looking at here, 83% of uh, Christian nationalism adherents who are white disagree with that statement um, about uh, structural racism. Uh, and then uh, look at Christian nationalism adherents of color on this, right? Really different 
um, here. So like, again, the first one, uh, Christian national adherents of color look like the general population, only 46% disagree uh, with that statement. And you can see these gaps, 20, 30, even 40, almost 40 points um, on the first one. So even within kind of Christian national adherence, kind of whiteness tends to have its own kind of uh, vector of operation uh, here. Um, here is one about anti-immigrant views. Uh, very similar. Uh, these are the number of Americans. Uh, for example, I'll do the bottom one this time as an example. Uh, immigrants are invading our country and replacing our cultural and ethnic backgrounds, essentially uh, a survey version of kind of so-called replacement theory that you've kind of heard kind of uh, uh, bouncing around conservative media. Um, only 32% uh, uh, of Americans agree with that statement, uh, but 71% of Christian nationalism adherents agree with that statement, right? Um, and if you look at uh, those who are white, it ticks up another 10 points, uh, right? Christian national adherents who are white, much more likely to hold this kind of anti-immigrant uh, view and Christian national adherents of color, uh, higher than the general population, but uh, nearly 30 points different uh, than those who are white uh, among Christian, uh, Christian nationalism. Uh, another one around anti-Muslim views. Uh, we have a couple of questions here. The values of, of Islam are at odds with American values and way of life. Um, that question was on a scale that says, do you think that this describes uh, the, the situation in the U.S. today completely or somewhat? Uh, are those, those who we've graphed, and then we should prevent uh, people from some majority Muslim countries from entering the U.S. These are people who agree. Uh, so the, again, the general population, um, take the bottom one, prevent people from coming uh, from entering the U.S., 29% of the public, but 67% of Christian nationalism adherents uh, agree with that statement. And then if we look at uh, numbers who are white, again, it ticks up a little bit, not quite as much as it did, as it did in the other questions. Uh, and you can see this gap between Christian nationalism adherents who are white and those who are not white. So that's the pattern really on uh, anti-Muslim views, anti-immigrant views, and uh, attitudes around racism uh, with regard to African Americans. The view gets a little more complex when we get to anti-Semitism. Uh, so we have a number of, of questions here uh, that are um, around kind of attitudes about uh, Jewish Americans. And you can see, again, already the gap between all Americans and, um, uh, and the uh, Christian nationalism adherents uh, here. Um, and you, that gap is there, but look what happens when we look at white, uh, the Christian national adherents who are white, basically look at that average for Christian national overall, uh, and we see in a couple of places, actually Christian national adherents of color actually scoring a little bit higher um, on these attitudes uh, that kind of are correlated around um, anti-Semitism, particularly around Jewish people sticking together more than other Americans, uh, and this idea that American Christians love Israel uh, more than uh, most American Jews do. Uh, so, so some complexity there uh, in terms of race uh, among uh, Christian nationalism uh, adherents. And then finally, the other place that we, um, uh, we saw is that there's a high correlation between um, holding traditional patriarchal gender roles and adherence to Christian nationalism as well. So here, again, a number of statements here. Um, um, for society as a whole become too soft and feminine, for example. 38% uh, of the country agrees with that, but 66% of Christian national adherents uh, agree with that. And then you could look at the numbers of white and non-white. Here again, the differences aren't quite as pronounced. Um, and on a couple, uh, for example, in a truly Christian family, the, head, the husband is the head of the household and his wife submits to his leadership. Uh, we actually have um, cr Christian nationalism and adherents of color scoring slightly high, higher on that measure uh, than we do. But overall, again, it, this kind of idea of patriarchal gender roles is something highly correlated with Christian nationalism as well. Um, so we've said a little bit about whiteness in those, but two other places um, to kind of think about this. We had a standalone question that was not part of the scale uh, that really tried to put the idea of kind of Eurocentric Christianity right heart and center of the question. So uh, this question says, God intended America to be a new promised land where European Christians could create a society that would be an example to the rest of the world. So we've got kind of white Christianity built into um, the question here. Among all Americans, um, you'll see there's about three in 10 Americans agree with that statement. Uh, and then you could see it's highly stratified by Christian nationalism views. So Christian nationalism adherents, 83% uh, of, of, uh, of uh, well, uh, of Christian nationalism adherents and sympathizers kind of agree with that statement. Um, you can see it kind of going down here uh, uh, as you go down the scale for, toward rejectors as well. And here's the rest of the, the other side of that who, who mostly agree and mostly disagree. Uh, but again, this with uh, whiteness kind of built into it, you can see still highly correlated by Christian nationalism. Uh, the other thing the survey did uh, to try to test out, uh, because one of the challenges is with a survey is getting people to tell you things that are sensitive, right? People survey respondents, even if we 
um, kind of give them guarantees of an anonymity, which we do. These surveys are all online and anonymous. Uh, it's still sometimes difficult to get people to tell you the truth uh, about, especially things about racism. Uh, so we, we designed an experiment uh, where we basically gave, we split our sample in half, and because we had a big 6,000 person sample, we had two samples of 3,000 people. And we gave one group only the first three of these questions and, and asked them, and here's what we did. We said, don't tell us which one of these questions you agree with, just tell us how many you agree with, which gave them an extra level of anonymity, right? They could just say, I agree with two. I agree with three of those statements. So that was one half the sample. The other half of the sample, we gave all four questions. Same thing, don't tell us how many, or don't tell us which ones, just tell us how many. So I agree with three, I agree with four. So the, the, what, it turns out that uh, what you can do is because the sample is split, the only way the average number of questions people agree with can be higher on the treatment side is if people picked that last question, right? So it's a kind of indirect way of measuring uh, people being willing to pick something uh, that they might not be willing to tell you directly, right? So it, it turns out, uh, so that's what we did in the survey, and uh, we were able to estimate the number of people picking that fourth question, right, without telling us directly that they picked it. And it turns out that um, our, our estimates are that 17% of, the, of, of Americans picked that question, and, and it's a pretty strong one, right? The United States is a white Christian nation. I am willing to fight to keep it that way, right? That was the question, right? And we estimate using that survey experiment, 17% of Americans kind of hold that idea. And I just wanted to put up our scale here, our Christian nationalism adherence and sympathizer scale, just so you can see them side by side. It, it kind of gives us some confidence that we're probably we're in the ballpark here with, with our scale, uh, with that experiment kind of verifying somewhere in the middle of this group you know, the number of people who think this about it's a, not just a Christian nation, but a white Christian nation and willing to keep it um, that way. So um, uh, finally here, I'm going to wrap up with um, some questions around violence. And one of the kind of key concerns we saw on January 6th, right, is um, whether Christian nationalism leads itself to violence and, and willingness to, ki to kill, harm, or maim other or fellow citizens, attack our uh, government institutions here. Um, and so we asked some questions about whether people, when they've had a disagreement, um, have they done any of the following? Have they pushed, grabbed, or shoved someone? Have they hit, uh, bit, or slapped someone? Or have they threatened to use or actually use a gun, knife, or weapon on someone? So not that many Americans have done this, uh, right, um, uh, thankfully. Um, and you can kind of see the numbers here for, for all Americans. Uh, but it, it does turn out that among those who are Christian nationalism adherents, the numbers do tick up slightly. Uh, more likely uh, to say just in resolving disagreements here, and if you compare that to rejectors, you can see the gap, right? Those on the other opposite end of the spectrum. So that's kind of individual experiences or, or tendencies toward violence. Uh, what about political violence? Um, so we've been asking this question for a while. Um, uh, uh, this question about whether, uh, so it reads, because things have gotten us so off track, true American patriots may have to resort to violence in order to save our country. Um, here is all Americans, 16% uh, of the country uh, uh, agrees with that statement. But again, among those who are Christian nationalism adherents, that number jumps to 40. Uh, or, or, or among, yeah, it jump, jumps to 40%. Sympathizers is 22, and then you can kind of see it uh, going down. So there is a much higher uh, uh, relationship between attitudes toward political violence um, uh, as well among Christian nationalism adherents. So on that cheery note, um, I'm going to kind of wrap the presentation, uh, and uh, I'm going to take my seat. I'll have a little bit more to say in terms of commentary um, as part of the panel, uh, but thank you for your patience, and with that, let me welcome the panel to join me. Okay. Um, I always have uh, some compliment for... Um, the way in which Robbie does PowerPoints, I, I try to find some metaphor. I will prove myself to be a Boston Celtics adherent and sympathizer by saying he is the Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown of PowerPoints. And uh, if you know me, you know that's a People really list. high compliment, Robbie. That was a fantastic. I, I, I want to thank Melissa for pointing out this is the 17th time We've done this together. Um, you don't count when you're having a good time, so I had no idea. Uh, but it's not surprising, and Bill Galston and I and all the people at Brookings are really, really grateful for this partnership uh, with PRI. I, I do want to thank, so I don't forget, uh, Catalina Navarro, the person you see running around to make sure this actually works, has done so much work to put this together. 
Uh, Max Keeney, my assistant, is here somewhere. Max has worked really hard. And I, I want to go back and thank Megan Bell, my former assistant, uh, who has done, did exceptional work when Robbie and I first started and Bill first started uh, talking about uh, uh, this uh, project. Um, in, I, one thing I want to underscore is that in all of this polling, all 17 surveys, we have always assumed that religion has an important role to play uh, in uh, public life. The name of the organization, Robbie and Melissa's organization suggests that. Um, but uh, the issue is how this commitment uh, to religion and its role in public life is disciplined in a free and pluralistic uh, society, um, you know, uh, which is marked by a dedication to the religious freedom of all people, believers and non-believers uh, alike. And that's why, um, it, or that's why this study, I think, is very important. And one other note uh, here uh, that I feel obligated to do. Tomorrow there is a memorial service at the National Cathedral for a friend of many of ours, Michael Gerson, uh, a, uh, who is a columnist for the Washington Post, um, a very devout, faithful, and eloquent Christian and a conservative and he wrote an extraordinary essay uh, at the end of his life uh, where he condemned an approach to politics that he said was closer to Game of Thrones than the Beatitudes. Mm. Uh, nowhere, uh, Mike went on, did Jesus demand political passivity from his followers, but his teaching are, are entirely inconsistent with an approach to public engagement that says, this Christian country is mine, you are defiling it, and I will take it back by any means uh, necessary. I just want to honor Mike today because he's in the thoughts of uh, so many of ours, uh, so many of us. Um, we have an amazing uh, panel here today, and we are very, very grateful. Uh, and um, I will uh, introduce them. Um, well, I'll, I'll just start with uh, Jamar uh, Tisby. He is the author of the New York Times bestselling book, The Color of Compromise. What a great title. Uh, the Truth About the Church's Complicity uh, in Racism. His latest book is How to Fight Racism, a Young Readers uh, Edition. And he is the co-host of, co of the Pass the Mic podcast. He's been the co-host since its exception uh, seven years ago. Uh, Kristen Kobes dumay is the William... See, I got your name right. I'll get your professorship wrong. The William Spolhoff? How about... Smolhoff Chair and Professor of History and Gender Studies at Calvin University. Uh, her research focuses on the intersection of gender, religion, and politics. And she's the author, another great title uh, for a book. She is the author of the New York Times bestselling book, Jesus and John Wayne, uh, How White Evangelicals Corrupted a Faith and Fractured a Nation. And finally, a very, very old friend of mine. Uh, you know, he's not old. I, I've, I've committed, by the way. I'm never going to describe old friends anymore. A dear friend. <laughs> um, it, we've known each other for a long time. Pete Weiner is, um, is the in-residence senior fellow at the Trinity Forum, a contributing opinion writer, as many of you know, for the New York Times uh, and the uh, contributing editor at the Atlantic um, uh, Pete served in the Reagan, George H.W. Bush, and George W. Bush administrations, including as deputy director of speech writing, and later, one of my favorite White House titles ever, the director of the Office of Strategic Initiatives uh, for President George W. Bush. Some of you will remember the Saturday Night Live skit about strategery. Uh, Pete was the strategery coordinator. Um, he is uh, the uh, author... Uh, a co-author with Mike Gerson of City of Man, Religion, and Politics in a New Era. Um, his most recent book is uh, The Death of Politics, How to Heal Our Frayed Republic After Trump. There's a good thought. Uh, and um, we will begin uh, in the, um, it will begin today uh, in the order I mentioned. Jamar, why don't you start us off? Thank you. Hi, everybody. My name's Jamar. Why don't we each go around and introduce ourselves? <laughs> <laughs> and all 1,500 people online. <laughs> right, right, right. Uh, shout out to you coming out on a random Wednesday morning to hear about a light and fuzzy topic like Christian nationalism. Um, it can be heavy. It can cause us to go like this and frown. But being together and learning 
and trying to do something about it makes me feel like smiling. <laughs> so we're going to go on a journey. It's going to be okay. We're going to be dealing with some hard facts, but we'll do it together. How's that? All right. So with that preamble, let me make this statement. White Christian nationalism is the greatest threat to democracy and the witness of the church in the United States today. White Christian nationalism is the greatest threat to democracy and the witness of the church in the United States today. These data back it up. I define Christian nationalism as an ethno-cultural ideology that uses Christian symbolism to create a permission structure for the acquisition of political power and social control an ethnocultural ideology that uses Christian symbolism to create a permission structure for the acquisition of political power and social control. Lots of different definitions out there, many of them very good. That's just how I think of it. As we look at these most recent findings, one particular aspect stood out to me as a historian of race and religion, and it was this part. It says, there are minimal differences in adherence to Christian nationalism beliefs by race. Minimal differences. Rates of support for Christian nationalism are roughly the same among white Americans, about 30% lean. And black Americans, about 30% lean toward Christian nationalism. And I said, huh, that's interesting given the racial implications and ramifications of Christian nationalism, how could it be that there are minimal differences by race? And then I thought about it. Two things came up. One, there has always been some cooperation of the oppressed with the oppressor. This is how you get the, the, the trope of the Uncle Tom, right? It's the idea that you betray your own community and take sides with the dominant power. So that's always the case in, in whatever kind of oppression you're dealing with. But secondly, black Americans as a group are a highly religious group. On average, most Americans believe in God or a higher power. According to a Pew Research study in 2021, 97% of black Americans believe in God or a higher power. And the vast majority of those folks are Christian, Protestant at that. So it wouldn't surprise us that this language of God and country resonates with black people. The difference is, what do we mean? What do we mean by those words? I contrast white Christian nationalism with black Christian patriotism. Nationalism and patriotism. Let me give you one example. Last night, we heard the State of the Union, and if you had your caffeine going, you heard the response to the State of the Union from Sarah Huckabee Sanders, the new governor of Arkansas. She ran against Chris Jones, a black man with a PhD from MIT. What's so interesting about those two figures is that they both ran what I call faith-forward campaigns. They foregrounded their Christian faith. They're both children of preachers, they both adhere to Christianity. Chris Jones is a minister. And yet what they meant when they looked at the intersection between faith and politics was very different. Just broadly speaking, when you talk about white Christian nationalism, it tends toward a rigid, narrow, authoritarian kind of politics. When you're talking about black Christian patriotism, it tends toward an expansive flexible, inclusive kind of politics. And so it's not just the words people use, it's the ramifications of what they mean by those words. 
Now, you've heard me say a couple of times white Christian nationalism. I think Christian nationalism is a perfectly appropriate term. It takes less time to say. <laughs> but I don't want us to forget the white in the white Christian nationalism part. That is to say, we cannot overlook the racial dimensions of Christian nationalism. Dr. Jones pointed some of that out. I'll just remind us that as we see resurgence of what we're now calling white Christian nationalism, that tends to happen around times when black rights are expanding. So we can look at sort of the most notorious group that represents white Christian nationalism, and if you never thought of them in these terms, I think it'll be appropriate, the Ku Klux Klan. First arose in the 1860s. What happened then? Emancipation after the Civil War. They got real active again in the 1950s and 60s. What was going on then? A civil rights movement where black people were pushing for more civil rights. But perhaps the most widespread and virulent form happened in the Jim Crow era. What was going on then? Coincided in 1915 with this film, The Birth of a Nation, which mythologized and romanticized the founding of the Klan and of a white Christian, mainly Protestant America. So, in conclusion, White Christian nationalism is not only the greatest threat to democracy and the witness of the church in the United States today, to put a finer point on it, white Christian nationalism is the greatest threat to a multiracial, inclusive democracy and a diverse church in the United States today. Thank you. I want to thank Jamar, and I want to, if I could, uh, you, you raised a couple of issues, which I'd like to sort of throw down to Robbie to think about at the end, because Robbie is going to respond, because uh, there are two things I'd love you to talk about uh, that you didn't in the PowerPoint. One is the remarkably close relationship of attitudes toward Christian nationalism to attitudes both toward Donald Trump and toward Joe Biden when you go through the data. And my read, and you could help me on this, when we're looking at the data, is that there is actually some differentiator within the Republican coalition uh, on, you know, uh, measured by attitudes toward Christian nationalism. The other thing, which thank you for mentioning the rise of the Klan, um, the, um, I, uh, so much of your research shows similarities between uh, white Catholics and white Protestants. There's a real split uh, between Catholics and Protestants uh, in all of this data, white Catholics and white Protestants. I'd be curious for you to address those. And with that, I want to turn, by, by the time this panel is done, we're going to have five million great questions that Robbie's <laughs> going to have to answer. Uh, I'll go to Pete. And Pete, thank you so much for joining us, too. Thanks, thanks, EJ, ladies and gentlemen, for, for being here. Uh, Jamar, for those uh, powerful uh, and, uh, and I think true, uh, true comments. A um, couple of points. I'll turn it over to Kristen, and, and then we'll, we'll have a conversation. Um, maybe the first one to begin with, I'm going to speak as a person of the Christian faith, uh, because I am a person of the Christian faith. It's um, core to, to, to who I am. And I just want to say what I think is a cognitive dissonance, which is I think it'd be hard to find uh, a figure in human history less likely to be a Christian nationalist than Jesus. Mm -hmm. um, it's, uh, I, I just think the cognitive dissonance of that is a tremendously power, powerful. This is a person who was trying to break down the dividing walls and didn't see in nationalist terms, and yet to see him invoked or his movement invoked or his, those who claim to follow his name to use Christian nationalism the way they do um, is, um, is, is, is puzzling and, and in many ways um, horrifying and, and, and saying that as a person um, of the Christian faith. Second uh, thing that I want to do is um, when I go over the data that Robbie amassed, um, which is very, very helpful, I think it does need to be disaggregated, and he touched on this in his remarks. One is just the general public, uh, how much affinity is there, varying degrees of affinity for Christian nationalism in the country as a whole, um, and it's certainly not a majority. Um, but then how much um, of a hold does that movement have on the Republican Party? 
Um, and that's a very different question. Two-thirds um, of white evangelicals have some degree of affinity with how white nationalism, white Christian nationalism is defined. The um, evangelic, white evangelicals are the core, uh, the most important constituency in the Republican mm -hmm. Party. And so they basically uh, carry the tune, uh, and, and, and the party itself um, follows it. So there's a disproportionate influence on one of the two most important political parties uh, in the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that means that this, what I perceive to be a threat, uh, is, is larger than just the aggregate numbers would, would say. Uh, I'd also um, make the point that, um, that there, are, there are views that one has, and then there's the question of what flows from the views. Mm. Right? So you can check a box and say, I agree or I disagree with X. That's very different from thinking that what I believe is going to drive me to act. Mm. And I do think uh, a couple of the numbers that stood out to me that that are in the, uh, in, in, in the poll and data was 17% of white Christian nationalists are willing to fight to, uh, to keep the country that way. And the other is the resort to violence, um, 40%, 40, 40%. 40 what I think that means is it's not, again, just how you check your box on a view. Uh, life and politics is about disposition, temperament, and sensibilities. And I think that this Christian white Christian nationalism view is shaping sensibilities in a very strong way. I, I, EJ uh, has covered politics for, for a long time, too, but I can't remember the sort of the energy that's behind this movement and politics in general mm. um, in, in my lifetime in, in politics. Politics is, by its nature, a passionate endeavor, and it should be because it involves a lot of, a lot of stuff. But I think the aggression and the cultural aggression that we're seeing now is different um, and, and worrisome. Third thing I want to talk about is, is catechesis, it's a fancy word, but if you talk to a lot of people within the Christian community, theologians, pastors, it's the shaping of those, of those sensibilities. Um, and in a lot of w uh, conversations that I've had with pastors and theologians, they talk about this failure of catechesis. Um, and we saw that, Robbie, in, in the uh, sources of information that people in watch. This is what they imbibe. <clears throat> Russell Moore is a good friend of mine, has a, has a term. Uh, he talks about Jesus as a hood ornament. Mm -hmm. um, and I think what's happened, and this is unwitting, I think, for a lot of people, those Christian faith, they would say that <clears throat> the Christianity following uh, Jesus is the most important thing in their life. I think in practice it's not. And I think that a lot of people are blind to it. And, and I'm going to confess, I'm sure I've struggled with this too. It's easier to see it in other people, blind spots, than it is obviously in your, in your own. But I think what's happening is that culture, sociology, politics, partisanship <clears throat> is the thing that's driving a lot of people's views. And faith is subordinate to that. And then people proof text mm -hmm. the Bible to affirm what, what, they, uh, what they already believe. So I think this catechesis point is, uh, is a very important one. And just one figure that I'll mention in that context is Tucker Carlson. Tucker Carlson is the most important figure on the American right media. He's the most important figure at Fox News. And you can see uh, a, uh, the direction that he's going in, um, you know, over time. And it's a bad direction, and it's an ugly direction, and it's a dangerous direction. But that's the kind of fuel that's, that's uh, driving, driving this. And last thing, I, and this is echoing what Jamar, a lot of what I said, I guess, is echoing what he said. But... You know, that we're talking here about the threat to American democracy, um, which is really important, and we should care about that. Um, but I do want to end by emphasizing the threat to American Christianity. Um, th this, this is acid. Uh, this is acid. And a lot of people who are not a people of faith are watching this unfold, and they're looking at it, and they're saying, this is a freak show. You want me to join this thing? Um, and this is antithetical, as Mike uh, wrote, to, to the Beatitudes and to, and to much else. And I do think that if this issue is going to be solved, at least mitigated, an awful lot of work has to come from the church itself. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that is a task. A lot of people that I know, pastors and theologians, again, 
are really concerned about, but they're searching around because they haven't traditionally wanted to involve themselves in politics. Mm -hmm. But they're going to have to do it mm -hmm. um, because that's the landscape. And if that's happening, if this is unfolding among your own adherents, it seems to me you have some moral obligation um, to be able to, to take responsibility uh, for, uh, for that. There's a great line in Wordsworth in, in the poem, The Prelude, that we have loved, others will love, and we will teach them how. And I do think that people who are authentic um, followers of, of, of Jesus um, have to um, love that, and they have to teach other people within their community how to love that as well. Thank you so much, Pete. That's really powerful. Um, and I just want to say before um, I uh, turn to uh, Kristen, um, the last point Pete made I think is really dramatized uh, uh, by one of the slides that uh, Robbie showed us, which is there is a really radical difference in attitudes toward Christian nationalism between Americans 65 and over and those 18 to 29. Mm -hmm. And when you look at people who are disaffiliating from religion, uh, they are overwhelmingly in, in significant numbers in that 18 to 29 Category, and I don't think, and I, Pete suggests this, I don't think these facts are uh, inconsistent. Not only are they not inconsistent with each other, I think these facts are related. But uh, thank you, Pete, so much. Uh, Kristen, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. So as a historian, let me start off by saying that Christian nationalism is nothing new, right? And uh, it might seem like it because the media has recently kind of discovered it. It's a, it's a handle uh, that can help us talk about some of these patterns. Uh, but if you, if you look at thinking that America was uh, founded as a Christian nation, that America's laws should reflect Christian values, that true Americans are Christians, right? These are commonly held views over time, uh, and, but they, they find expression in different ways. And so sometimes liberal Protestants are going to uh, promote these values. Black Protestants, again, in different ways. Um, since the 1970s, the dominant strand of Christian nationalism is that that has been shaped by the Christian right. right? And that's really what we're talking about here for the most part, and that's what this survey is illuminating. So um, a couple of things have changed, though, I think. In, in terms of, it's only quite recently that you have people proudly self-identifying as Christian nationalists. You, you could see some evidence of that in, in this survey. And uh, people like Marjorie Taylor Greene, most prominently. Uh, you've got folks like Andrew Torba, founder of Gab, right, writing a book on Christian nationalism. And inside Christian spaces and conservative evangelical spaces, we're seeing more people embrace the term. Um, yes, I'm a Christian nationalist. Not only am I a Christian nationalist, but all Christians ought to be Christian nationalists. True Christians are, by definition, Christian nationalists, right? Uh, this is not still the majority view, though. I would say that there is still a lot of pushback inside these spaces, that uh, uh, those who would adhere to ideas that we label Christian nationalism will often reject the label still. And say that is a, a smear campaign that the left is using, the media is using to smear good Christian Americans, right? And so it's a contested term inside these spaces. Um, just a couple of days ago, I got a letter from somebody, an email, who said exactly this. This is a smear campaign from the left. I have yet to see anybody in the media, any scholar, define Christian nationalism. <laughs> professor that I am, I responded with a couple of book suggestions and a number of <laughs> links to surveys, right? Um, <laughs> he wasn't particularly receptive, but um, I hold out hope. It, when we look at surveys then, what do we see, right? We see nuance. We see variation. Not all Republicans are Christian nationalists. Not all white evangelicals are Christian nationalists. We also see variation in terms of uh, enthusiasm, adherence, right? We have the adherence and we have the sympathizers. And these are kind of boxes, but then within those boxes, there is a range of views. There's a spectrum of levels of commitment, right? And that is really important to keep in mind. Surveys also show us 
what this actually means, right? What, what both Jamar and Pete have already surfaced here. Um, what does this actually mean? And we can see that Christian nationalist commitments, some of these core commitments, correlate to a number of these where we can flesh the, this out. What are the contours of Christian nationalism today with respect to race and racism, with respect to immigration, with respect to patriarchy, political violence, authoritarianism, right? And we see these correlations, and we see a lot of consistency over time across various surveys. And as a historian, let me say that the, the data being produced by social scientists here aligns very closely with what I've seen in the historical evidence as well, right? So there's a, a lot of, um, uh, there's a close fit here. Uh, just last night, I got a call from a local reporter who is covering a, essentially a Christian nationalist takeover of a local county commission. And, and she's very, very sharp. Um, she's not a Christian herself, not used to covering religion. And so she said, I just have one question I can't quite parse out. I'm not a Christian, but I've read the Christian Bible, and I've, I've, I don't understand what's Christian about this. Because when I look at the teachings of Jesus Christ, as he was saying, I don't see how it logically follows that these, these positions, right? And I said, that would be a really great question to put out to some of these uh, you know, Christian nationalist county commissioners, right? And so there is, there is that tension, and, and this, this, um, surveys are going to show us what this actually means, how this is uh, worked out. A um, couple of other points here. Uh, the fact that there's a lot of uh, consistency across these surveys in terms of how this is working out in contemporary Christian nationalist uh, circles mm -hmm. is because these are not random uh, commitments or, or kind of ran, uh, uh, randomly collected agenda. There is a deeper story mm -hmm. underneath these that um, is, is, defines a sense of meaning, purpose, and identity for those who hold these views. And just one example, um, uh, patriarchy, gender. How does this actually work in the stories that, I'm a scholar of conservative evangelicalism, the stories that they tell themselves, it all fits together. God has created strong men, given them strength, aggression, to protect faith, family, and nation. Uh, Christian nationalism uh, turns around a sense of loss. Right? Something has been lost that needs to be restored. There is a sense of threat, this us versus them, and therefore we need to fight to restore Christian America, and strong men have to, def have to fight to defend their faith and their nation. Right? So there is this uh, deep story. Finally, uh, what kind of threat are we looking at? I will say I'm hearing from a lot of people, not just reporters, but ordinary folks at the local level, saying this is a real threat. People are leaving, moving out of their states, moving out of school districts, and feeling this at the local level. National level, the threat to our democracy, and here I'm going to echo, I think, what Pete was suggesting, is that um, among adherents, there are clear anti-democratic impulses here, very clear uh, democracy is held up as idolatry in some of these circles. What is more important, upholding democracy or upholding God's law, right? And the answer is clear. Uh, but that's not the case for all who lean in this direction. Uh, the commitment to democracy varies here. Uh, but as we look at what threat we, this actually poses, and if, if we look to the future, what I have my eye on is these sympathizers mm -hmm. and precisely where their sympathies lie. Thank you so much. Um, I'm, I'm so grateful for those comments. Uh, two points I want to lift up. One is it is really important to know there's a long history of Christian nationalism in the United States. There were Christian nationalists movements and parties in the 1930s, some of them very anti-Semitic, um, that were very active in the country. So this term is not new. Uh, secondly, if I may invoke scripture uh, at some risk, you know, in my father's house, there are many mansions. In Robbie's surveys, there are many boxes. And I think one of the things that those of you who look at this survey uh, in more detail um, might think about is there's a lot of subtlety here. Uh, just before the event started, 
we were talking about the, the, the difference you underscored between sympathizers and adherents. Uh, this is very complicated, uh, and it's something to bear in mind. And 10% is a big number, but it's not a big number. And, and it's worth thinking about what that means for our polity. Um, before Robbie begins, I want to say that we got at, we put out an invitation, and again, thank you, Catalina, for organizing this, for questions that people out in the country had. And in my time at Brookings, and maybe I missed something, I have never seen a response like we got to this event. A question after question after question from New England to the Deep South, from the East Coast to the West Coast, through the Rockies and Plains. It's amazing how many people, and I'm just going to read, we cannot, uh, I am sorry, I hope we answered some of, some of the questions I think we've answered. We cannot answer them all directly. I just, before Robbie begins with his reply, I just want to read a few of them to give you a flavor of what people around the country were interested uh, in. Um, is Christian nationalism liable to decline if Trump is not elected president? What relations can be discerned regarding beliefs in climate change and identity as a Christian nationalist? What, what, what is the role, and uh, Pete raised this, of Christian school educators in combating Christian nationalism? Is Christian nationalism inherently authoritarian or intolerant, or are there moderate forms? How do you start a conversation with friends who don't think this is a problem? Um, and um, just a one other, uh, two others. And then I, I could, the whole list, I could take the whole event with all these good questions. Uh, what are the connections, if any, between the so-called prosperity gospel and white Christian nationalism, which I thought was a really interesting and sophisticated question. And, uh, and again, to go back to Pete's question, how can clergy be persuaded to return to teaching Jesus instead of division. Um, anyway, I, these, I want to thank everybody out there for these questions. Uh, and Robbie, you can take all of those, Great. plus the ones I threw at you, and do it very economically in a few minutes. Yeah. Uh, all right, I want to make sure we leave some time for the questions yeah, in here. And then we uh, so, do but I do want to, to just, I'll just try to stitch together a few things um, that I'm thinking. So I'm so glad to have historians in the room, by the way. Thank you uh, for that. Um, you know, Jamar, to, to your points, you know, the one thing I, I, I was interested in is to seeing the way, what difference white identity made, right? So even in people who share the set of uh, commitments to kind of Christian supremacy, really, in, in, in the country, and like that, you know, the one that, yeah, the, uh, you know, the U.S. law should be based on Christian values. I mean, pretty straightforward. These are, by the way, just like, all, if you go back and look at all five of those questions, they are all anti-democratic sentiments, right? And when I make that point uh, to, to sure, they are Christian dominionist sentiments. Um, all right? They're fundamentally incompatible with a pluralistic democracy. So I want to like, get that out there too. But even, even inside there, what you see is that the way they correlate, there's some complexity as I showed, but the way they correlate with concepts of anti-blackness, concepts of anti-immigrant uh, attitudes and, and, um, and anti-Muslim attitudes in particular is where whiteness really wear, rears its head, in, even inside of uh, the group that shares those, those sentiments. And I think, and, and it, it's stronger, right, among those who go to church, right? So like, that's the thing we got to like remember here. And so that takes me to, to, to Pete. And Pete, like, so as someone, so I grew up, you know, in the South as an evangelical, Southern Baptist in Jackson, Mississippi. And it is heartbreaking to see this data, right? Those are my people. Right, and you see that data, and, and the, but the, the journey that I've, I've been on is I realize you know, and what Chris said, this is not new, and how do we get how do we get here? Right, that we've lost all purchase on the difference between the Jesus of the Bible and you know the stuff, and and I think the way we got here is you know the Southern Baptist Convention, which became and still is the largest expression of Protestant Christianity in the country, was founded to justify slavery. That's how we got here, right? And so every time we took the path of accepting white supremacy as part and parcel of Christianity, which we did over and over and over through Jim Crow, through the Civil Rights Movement, right? Every time we did that, we strengthened its hand, right? And so now we wonder about it, the impotence of our churches to kind of wrestle control back, right? But it's because for hundreds of years, we've accepted 
right? This, 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 these things as being compatible. Uh, so I think that's, that's the real challenge. And on the not new part, I think that, that's really important. This is a new label for a very old problem. And the one thing I wanted to point to, to that, that hasn't really come up, but this, this idea of America as a promised land for European Christians, right? It is so deep and so strong, right, uh, within us. And, and this idea that you, the word you, you will hear this prefix re over and over and over, reclaim, revive, uh, restore, right, uh, it, and make America great again, right? All these backward-looking, reclaiming kind of things, I think, are about how old this idea really is and the power that it has uh, with, with us today. Um, so I'm, I'll stop there. Uh, just uh, Would you just uh, briefly, the question, two questions I had, uh, that, just to share the data a bit, um, one on the direct connection to politics, which I think people, yeah, I found Trump. really striking on just looking at Trump and Biden. And the other is, I was really struck, you know, because as a student of your work, seeing over time the, 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 the differences between white Catholics and white Protestants yeah. really diminishing on a lot of questions. And this one, you really had quite a gap. I was curious your reflections on that. Yeah, okay, great. So just, just quickly then, um, so it, it is also... Christian nationalism is also very tightly tied with support for Trump. Um, so in this survey, our overall favorability for Trump is 32%, right? That's pretty consistent with other, other surveys. So among all Americans, 32%. Um, I'll just give you the numbers as they go up. Among uh, Christian nationalism rejectors, uh, it is 8%. Among Christian nationalism skeptics, it is 29%. Among Christian nationalism sympathizers, it jumps to 57%. Uh, and among Christian nationalism adherents, it is 81%, uh, percent, right? So you can just see that, and, and Biden just looks like the inverse of, of that, essentially, um, uh, there. And then the other question was about, oh, about, um, yes, yeah, so on that, that religion slide, uh, what we did see is you still see white evangelicals up there. On, on some other measures, we did see this clustering of basically white Christians, whether they were Catholic or Protestant, right? Yeah. And you see that in, still in voting patterns some. There is this you know, if we look at voting patterns, white evangelicals tend to vote like 80% for Republican presidential candidates. White Catholics, uh, white mainline Protestants, uh, the, non, the non-evangelical Protestants tend to vote about 6 and 10 uh, for Republican uh, candidates. We see a little bit more distance uh, between the evangelicals and the... Um, so the white evangelicals are still... Protestants are very, still very distant from the white Catholics, but the mainliners and the, and the white Catholics are further down. They're only about 3 and 10. Um, who are either in the white Christian adherents or the, uh, the sympathizer category. So there's more distance on this question uh, between, between those two. Yeah, I was grateful to Jamar for bringing up the Klan. Uh, and, and it's worth, I think, there may, I wonder if there's some um, historical memory lurking back there because the revived Klan in the 20s was anti-immigrant, anti-Catholic, anti-Semitic, right. as well as anti-black. And it was all... Uh, linked uh, together, and you wonder if there's part of that. Uh, Jamar, did you want to yeah, comment just... on that? Because I, I, I think you, I, you almost feel it in the data, but go ahead. We don't have to speculate. Uh, <laughs> so this is a quote from the founder of the resurgent clan <laughs> in, uh, in a New York Times article in the 1920s remarking about and describing the Klan, he said, the Ku Klux Klan admits membership to none but native-born, white, Gentile, Protestant Americans whose statement of principles was a restoration of the fundamental principles of American democracy as embodied in the Constitution and an organization whose code of conduct was Christianity. Thank you. I don't think I've ever had as on point an answer as that one. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Last thing before we go to the audience, and we're going to have mics going around. By the way, uh, if you could confine preaching to the weekend, we'd be grateful if you could uh, keep your... Um, uh, notice, that was a cross-tradition question. Weekend, broadly. Uh, Friday through Sunday. Um, the... Um, <laughs> Uh, if, if you could keep your question short, I'd like to bring a lot of people in uh, for that uh, period. A lot of interest uh, on these questions in anti-Semitism. Um, what can you say about that, Robbie, and anyone else on the panel? 
Yeah, I mean, there was more complexity, as I showed on those slides on, on yeah. anti-Semitism um, there, with actually some of the scores among white Christian adherents of color being slightly higher, right? And that's something we didn't see on, on many of the other measures. Uh, so that's within white Christian uh, nationalism adherents, but it's still worth saying that it, uh, white Christian nationalism is positively correlated with anti-Semitic attitudes, right? We should just not miss the forest for the trees uh, here. There is this kind of racial complexity within the group, uh, but it is part and parcel of, you know, the worldview uh, here. Yeah, thank you. I, I said interest. I should have said concern uh, in the among many of the uh, many of the questioners. So, who wants to uh, uh, start? Uh, uh, we've got uh, Rachel. Do you want to come in? So, I'll go across the first row and right around. So, why don't I take all three of you, if I could, uh, and then people can pick. Um, pick the questions they want and evade the hard ones that they don't want to answer. Please, welcome. It's great to see you. Thank you very much. Um, economic power up until the 60s pretty much rested with white people. It didn't matter if you were in control of the Ford GM <clears throat> management structure or you had the day versus the night shift um, in the factory floor. So... Isn't it true for white people that they have less economic power and feel that way than they did in 1955 when they didn't have to compete with blacks, they didn't have to compete with women? I'm not justifying it. I'm just saying the average 75-year-old remembers when they ruled, rich or poor. Thank you for that. Thank you so much. Uh, Rachel Lazar, right over here. Uh, Catalina? I'm just going to do this corner here, and then we'll do we'll do it geographically. Go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, this this has been incredible. Thanks for the amazing research once again, Ravi. Um, so, church state separation feels like the obvious solution and antidote, right? Because for a group that is trying to cement their power and privilege and codify it in our law, if we say you have to separate church and state, you fight back effectively. What is the most important strategy in your minds for nationally recommitting to church-state separation? And especially since we're such a predominantly still religious nation because of church-state separation. This Would you is... remind people of your job yes. uh, in spite of that question? <laughs> I am the president and CEO of Americans United for Separation of Church and State. <laughs> Bless you. Thank you. Sir, yeah, we'll, we'll do all four of you then. Yeah, go ahead. If you were real. Sure. Uh, Todd Stiefel, head of Stiefel Free Thought Foundation. Uh, I'm curious, at least in my mind, it feels like the kind of war on education that's going on in Florida and elsewhere is much rooted in a attempt to kind of whitewash the history of Christian nationalism in this country. And I'm curious if you folks agree with that and what we can do about it. And then lastly, for this round, thank you. Hi, I'm Amanda Tyler, Executive Director of Baptist Joint Committee for Religious Liberty and lead organizer of Christians Against Christian Nationalism. So I have um, two questions that really stood out for me from the excellent presentation, Robbie. One was the slide on the relationship between uh, Christian nationalism adherence and anti-black racism. And I thought it really complicated the question of the relationship of white supremacy and Christian nationalism. How much is this white supremacy that is using, in Jamar's words, the permission structure of Christian nationalism, and how much of this can be really attributed to Christian nationalism as an ideology itself? And the second um, slide that caught my attention was about the fact that the more, if you go to church more, you're more likely to be a Christian nationalist. <laughs> Um, I think that begs the question about what's going on in our churches and how much of it is Christianity, how much of it is Christian nationalism. That's an active conversation going on in a lot of quarters, and I would just love your understanding of how we understand Christianity as opposed to Christian nationalism. And could I add a, a, an extra point to that question, which is how much of it is a detachment of liberal Christians from Christianity? Because... The fact that their church going is connected to that suggests there, there's, there, it's a two-way street going on there. And I'd be very curious, who wants to, anyone else before Robbie throws data at us uh, with, with a great curve and fastball? Uh, yeah, go ahead. 
Yeah, I, I, I wanted to respond to this, too, in terms of what we saw in the, the media, kind of quote-unquote secular media, right? Fox News and so on, very important. I don't want to diminish their role. What's not in, uh, in this survey is Christian media and you know, explicitly Christian media, because I don't know that we can call Fox uh, secular uh, purely. <laughs> and, um, and so um, I mean, what we're looking at, this deep story, has been, I mean, use the term catechesis. We could, we could use the term um, indoctrination, um, grooming, if you will, or um, discipleship, right? You know, what are we talking about here? But what we see is for generations now, Christian publishers, Christian radio, Christian homeschool curriculum, Christian school textbooks have told this story, the story about America, the story about Christianity, right? It runs deep. And so this is not ultimately a story of politics hijacking religion, right? Christianity, you know, whether we we can make um, claims about you got Christianity wrong, but people who think they are Christians, who claim the Christian faith, are from the grassroots up uh, inculcating this, articulating this, and reinforcing it. So I think that's a very important point. And also the possibility that the mainstream media may give disproportionate attention. I suppose we are guilty of that today, but uh, that the mainstream media give disproportionate attention to this brand. I'd be curious, Pete, if you thought about that. I'd say yes and no. Um, yes, in the sense that, that white evangelical Christianity involves millions and millions of people, um, and really good and decent um, people. Um, and... Um, I know of stories, I mean, I was out at Calvin University a couple of weeks ago, and, and Nick Waldersdorf uh, was talking about the church that he had started and uh, to, to house Syrian refugees. I mean, you see this all over the country, these acts of tremendous charity and self-giving, the church that I'm a part of, McLean Prez, staking in Afghan refugees. Those stories often don't get told. They, they, uh, they ought to be told. On the other hand, this is this is real. I mean, something has changed, and this is a this is a real threat. We saw it most vividly in January six, and you see it see it rising. Um, if, this is ru- uh, below the radar, but I think it's important that this uh, tour that Michael Flynn, a former national security advisor, is doing, which is the imprimatur of Charisma News, is. Um, I mean, that's really grassroots, mm-hmm. and a lot of people aren't aren't following it. They they, they should. I just want to make one one quick point, in EJ. It, it touches on one of the questions you got, which is how do you start conversations with people who hold views different? Uh, and here I'm talking to you, but I'm also talking to myself. And that is, I have to be careful not to dehumanize the people who I disagree with. Yeah. Uh, it's really easy to do, and it's easy for, for me to put people in cartoon, create cartoon images and boxes in the same way that I feel like others do. In my experience, and this I've changed in the last 15 years, I would say 10, 15 years, I have much less faith in the capacity to overwhelm people by, uh, by arguments, by data, certainly by condescension. Um, ultimately, I don't know how you do this writ large. I do know how you do it writ small, which is you have to enter into people's lives. Um, and what, what I've tried to do when I've done it best, and I haven't always done it best, is to try and listen to the people Tell me about your experience. Why do you believe what you believe? Because Kristen says something very important. There are issues, and then these issues are often proxy for core identity, right? You're having a discussion with someone. You're thinking, why is there so much energy around this issue? And the reason is it's not the issue. It's what that issue represents. And when any of us feel our core identity is under attack, if we feel like we're losing power, if we think that the country is on the edge, if I think our kids are under attack, that's going to stir up a lot of strong feelings. So I just think it's really important to try and enter into the world without necessarily, I obviously have my strong views on this, without acceding to, to, uh, to them. So I just wanted to, to... Could I do the following? Um, what I'd like to do is have Jamar and Robbie close. I'm going to keep these three questions on tap for them. I have the church-state separation issue, the economic displacement issue, and the Florida, Florida policies uh, issue. Let me bring in two more people, and then Jamar, you can respond to any of this, and then Robbie will answer everything else. But let's uh, go over uh, who had hands on that side. Rich Sizek, uh, the three across here, if you'll be quick, because I'll, I'm going a little over time. Rich, grab the mic. 
Thanks. Uh, a number of evangelicals created Evangelicals for Democracy to respond to the threat broad threat, not just Christian nationalism, but the issue that uh, we found most interesting is the response of Hispanics. For example, we, we did a Facebook ad, you can look for it, it's called, uh, Was Judas the First Christian Nationalist? And pardon the theology, you know, don't, don't, don't decipher that, but the point was to factor out, uh, you know, what do people think about this? And we got an immediate response within a few weeks before the election of over 700,000 Hispanics when we put it in Spanish. And so my question, Robbie, and to anyone else is, we found, we found that the Hispanic community is particularly interested in the question and very susceptible. And any reactions uh, on that score? Thank you. Uh, sir, I think it was, uh, uh, or the lady in the back there? Oh, go ahead. I want, I want to give it to the gentleman, if you could be quick, and then the lady in the back there, and then we'll close. Do, do, I, do I need to identify myself? Dave Onspock, unaffiliated. Uh, you, I, I didn't see that you brought up the, uh, what I call the major, the chief inconsistency of the Christian nationalism today. Uh, the belief that the life is precious in a woman or girl, girl's womb and she be, should be required to give birth to it, but at the same time, after the life is born, that it become, become a burden on, on society, especially if it comes across the border or is dependent on welfare. Isn't that sort of an inconsistency that should be pointed out in Christian nationalism? Thank you. Thank you. And then, ma'am. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Thank you. Um, so, as was mentioned earlier on the panel, 10% um, isn't a lot, but then 10% is a lot, especially <laughs> in the American political system where um, a lot of our, like, institutions aren't necessarily uh, dependent on just, like, a strict majority, like the Electoral College or state government. Um, and I'm wondering if there's any disparities in the rate of adherence to white Christian nationalism between the electorate at large and then government officials, where we're seeing the people who are, are adherents in the electorate able to kind of leverage that collective power to have a disproportionate influence on governance in the United States. Uh, thank you. I, I just, just so it doesn't get lost on the economic displacement thing, uh, we could, I think there is, although not necessarily much in this survey, uh, some evidence that there is a linkage between this economic change in areas. You know, I think of the city of Detroit's lost two thirds of its population because of deindustrialization. The Pittsburgh lost half its population. I think there is evidence of a relationship between um, uh, some of this discontent and um, and economic change. But we could talk about it after. Yes. And then colored jobs, and then female jobs. And sometime in the 60s, that changed. And consequently, whites at the top or bottom of the income scale were competing to be on themselves. Thank you. Um, but I, anyway, that we should. There's a whole big argument and discussion to be had about. The, I'm glad you put that on the table, um, sir. Yeah, uh, Jamar. You're, so you've got this rich panoply to work with, and then Robbie can bring us home, and Bill will close <laughs> with a final <laughs> prayer or, or a final, uh, I guess, a prayer, but in, in the broad, inclusive sense. <laughs> don't don't leave anything on the table, Jamar. <laughs> Very good. Uh, to 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 the whole kind of uh, concept of white people, f some white people feeling embattled and disenfranchised, and it's not the America they once knew. I'll just say this oft-recited phrase, when you're accustomed to privilege, equality feels like oppression. When you're accustomed to privilege, equality feels like oppression. I didn't come up with that, but it's, it's very helpful, right? Uh, so as rights and wealth and resources get more equitably spread, which they're not even close to yet, then the people who had those privileges feel like something is being taken away when really we're just increasing equality. Um, to the schools, oh my, my, my. So I, I began as a sixth grade teacher and a middle school principal, and what is happening in our school systems is chilling. Last night, Sarah Huckabee Sanders announced that today she's going to release her education plan, which, given her talking points last night, just look like a big volley in the culture wars, right? 
And when I went to a conservative seminary in uh, Jackson, Mississippi, that was the first time I heard the phrase Caesar's schools, the idea of giving up your children to the secular state and how evil that was. So what I see happening is an attempt at one of two things, either to take over public education and put prayer back in schools and read the Bible and say, in God we trust, and all of those kinds of things in the public sphere in education, or completely defund and under-resource schools even more and funnel all of that toward, quote-unquote, school choice, which then allows uh, uh, institutions to teach and inculcate, disciple their students in, in this Christian nationalist ideology. So that's very important happening in real time right now. I'll also say a lot of the questions, um, particularly online, have to do with the practical aspects. What do we do? I would point to Christians Against Christian Nationalism. Just Google it. There's a whole suite of resources, mainly directed at the church because that's been a big part of the problem. But I think there's also resources for everyone there. The last resource I'll point to is one we should not overlook, but often do, which is the black church. Yeah. It is a religious institution expressly founded because of racism and white supremacy. And for generations has been combating what we're labeling white Christian nationalism, but what to black people has always been racial discrimination. And so this is a time, if we really want to see change, we've actually got to start learning from different voices than we're typically accustomed to learning from. And they don't have the most money. They don't have the biggest platforms. So we have to seek them out. But I'm letting you know it's there. It's there. Thank you. Robbie. Great. All right. Um, well, I'll start with Florida. Um, so my daughter lives in Florida. So I've been following uh, things fairly closely uh, down there. And, you know, I, I, the word that just keeps coming to my, to my mind, I haven't read anything about this, but it is cover up. Right, is that's what we're really seeing, right? Just at the moment that our very challenging history is coming to light, right? We have the Black Lives Matter movement kind of bringing this stuff up into uh, kind of broad international consciousness, right? Uh, at least in my generation, that's something fundamentally unique uh, um, uh, that I, you know, in my lifetime that I really haven't experienced. And I think just at the time that's coming to the fore, just at the time there's a reckoning with that history there's a cover-up, right? And I really, I think all of the stuff around so-called critical race theory is really about just not wanting to deal with this. How do we not deal? We take it off the shelves, right? Uh, just as there is an explosion of, of resources and books and stuff coming online, we just make sure that stuff's not there, right? Um, and so I, I think it is a denial of history uh, as a way of kind of maintaining the status quo, right? And that's really what's going on there. Um, and and it, it's under the guise of, of Christianity. Like, much of this is is going on. And, and um, you know, really this goes to your point too. Like I, you could take this, the point, your economic point to public schools, right? So I grew up in public schools in Jackson, Mississippi. We had a Christmas party in my homeroom every year, like without any sort of, you know, blink of an eye and any of that. Um, by the way, I'm 50, uh, 54. My school, my public school in Jackson, Mississippi wasn't even desegregated until I was in third grade. 1976, right, by the time desegregation actually happened in Jackson, Mississippi. So we had Christmas parties and all-white Christmas parties until third grade, right? Um, and so that, those changes, you know, um, they're big, right? And, and we are, like, that's, that's still very, you know, much barely in the rearview mirror. So I think we're still struggling, right, with these things that, are, that have happened. And then, want to, Rachel, to your point, um, one interesting thing, and, and we will have a longer conversation about this, but um, we did have a question about um, maintaining a separation of church and state in the survey. And it turns out that that language of maintaining a separation of church and state goes right by, um, right? And they, they, so people will hold all those Christian nationalist views and affirm separation of church and state at the same time, right? And so that's a real issue here. They don't think that they're violating this old civic idea of separation of church and state, even while they say the US, all the laws in the U.S. should be based on Christian beliefs in the Bible, right? So that's part of the challenge we're working with. So we end on a note of unity. Yeah, right. Uh, thank you. <laughs> I, I just want to thank our great panel, uh, Jamar, 
uh, Pete and Kristen and Robbie, it's a joy to work with you, and it's a joy to work with my colleague Bill Galston, who will close. Well, I hope you'll agree with me that this has been a spectacular panel uh, dealing with an incredibly important question. Uh, everybody has already been thanked, so let me just conclude with a brief benediction, which might also be regarded as a provocation. Uh, you know, Pete Weiner asked not the political question, but the politico-theological question. Namely, how do you get from Jesus to Christian nationalism? Great question with a great history. It only took 250 years to get from Paul's epistle to the Galatians to the Emperor Constantine, you know, in hoc signo winches. Uh, and uh, so this whole question of the relationship uh, between a universal faith and a national or even imperial mission is an ancient one, uh, not a modern one. Uh, and you know, to begin to understand the complexity of Christian universalism, but a universalism that claims to be the only true path to salvation, universalism and particularism in the same doctrine. Uh, one might do worse than to begin to reflect on Matthew 10.34, a passage that has intrigued and troubled me. And with that, we are adjourned. <laughs> Thank you.